Our scripture lesson this morning comes from uh, John chapter 21. Uh, we started looking at the Gospel of John on September the 12th, 2010, and we've been kind of going chapter by chapter, and, and this is the last chapter of the Gospel of John. And so let us go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, as is our prayer every Sunday, it's the prayer of John the Baptist when Jesus begins his ministry. May we decrease and may you increase. And from the lips of the psalmist of almost 3,000 years ago, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As many of you know, uh, before I came to Klamath Falls, uh, I was actually living in Grants Pass uh, as a consultant, helping churches uh, raise money all over the country. And I received in the mail from my cousin's son, Joel, who was in second grade in the Atlanta area, uh, a cutout of this boy, uh, you know, colored and laminate and everything, and I was introduced to this cutout. His name was Flat Stanley. Uh, you may have heard of Flat Stanley, uh, but it's this project, I guess the second graders, second or third graders were doing, and uh, basically, you know, cut it out and then take Flat Stanley wherever you go for a week, take pictures, of you and Flat Stanley together. And, um, you know, we'll come back next week and we'll share this with the class. So he said, uh, would you mind taking Flat Stanley with you on your travels this week? And uh, being a consultant, I, that meant I traveled Monday through Friday. And so on that particular week, I took Flat Stanley with me and we got pictures of Flat Stanley at Mount Rainier, uh, Mount Hood, Golden State Bridge, on the beaches of San Diego, the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, and some snow in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, we had pictures of Flat Stanley in the cockpit of Horizon Airlines and um, with some stewardesses and stuff like that. Um, by far, his presentation was the best. Uh, there's no doubt about it. In my mind, there was no doubt. Um, Julie made a nice little scrapbook thing with Flat Stanley. and um, oh, he was, We had a picture of him on the Rogue River, as a matter of fact. Um, our dog, Lily, attacked Flat Stanley, had a little Band-Aid on his arm. Um, fact, in fact, when we were going to get a picture of him down in Galice uh, with the sign, this is Galice, um, we had Flat Stanley up against the window. And then for some reason, I got hot. And I rolled down the window, and out went Flat Stanley. <laughs> Oh my God, he's been all over the country and now we're going to lose him along the Rogue River. But we found him in the bushes and he was okay. <laughs> oh, I was so nervous. So, it may sound a little hokey, but we're going to do this thing this summer called Don't Date David. Where's David? And so we have, uh, I know it's hokey. Um, we have pictures of me. They're not ready yet. They will be next Sunday. Pictures of me on a popsicle stick. And so as we go about our sabbatical and as I go around the country on a six-week trip with Julie and Faith and Joshua in a minivan, whew, um, <laughs> we'll be taking pictures and whatnot. Um, and so I, I, I want to go along with you on your trip uh, this summer as well. And so wherever you go, uh, take David with you uh, and get a picture of me with your family wherever you may go. And originally this sounded like a really fun and nice idea. And then when I said this at first service, it all of a sudden hit me, there's some people out there who will put me in places where I would probably <laughs> not frequent. And um, as someone said on the way out first service, we can't wait to take you to Las Vegas. And I'm like... <laughs> Okay, there's David at the craps table. Hey, great. Okay. 
So try to be kind wherever you go. Um, so it'll be fun. So take pictures of me with you, and then uh, we'll, we'll email them back into the church office. We'll get a map of the world, and we'll just start placing, placing your pictures and everything kind of all over the map, and it'll be kind of a fun exercise to see where we all go uh, this, this summer. Uh, this is uh, my last Sunday before the September 11th, and uh, people have been asking me all along, well, are you excited about the trip? Are you getting ready? Are you packed yet for your summer and everything? And, and I will have to say that it is with um, uh, mixed emotions that I, that I go on this sabbatical for three months. It's um, not sure what to expect. Uh, we do have some things planned uh, that we're very excited about, uh, but at the same time, uh, this is what I do. This is where I am. This is where I've been for the last seven years, uh, every day of the week. And to be a way to step aside, to remove myself uh, for 90 days or so, I don't even know what that's going to be like. Um, I'm nervous. I'm scared. I'm, I'm a little uneasy about it. I'm excited to see family and friends across the country, spend time with my own family. Uh, but I would appreciate your prayers because I, I really don't know what it's going to be like. I uh, wish I could tell you, but I, I, don't, I don't even know. So please pray for, for safety uh, as we're on the road. Uh, appreciate that. Someone said earlier, I'm not going to pray for you, but I'll pray for the other guys coming at you. Uh, okay, that's, that's good. So it's been seven years. We've done seven program years uh, here uh, together. It's uh, fascinating for me to look out here today and realize that seven years ago, I did not know any of you, not, not one of you. Uh, and what a joy it's been over the last seven years uh, to get to know you. It all started on May the 18th, 2004, uh, when Don Boyd called my home in Grants Pass and said, this is Don Boyd of Klamath Falls, Oregon. I said, hey, Don, how are you? 110%. I said, all right. And uh, so we talked about this church, and uh, I, I said, well, June and I, we're coming over this weekend. Uh, we had a bunch of things planned for the consecutive weekends after that. This was the only free weekend. Um, so uh, we showed up on Saturday, May 22nd, 2004, met with the Pastor Nominating Committee, and uh, then they took, me out to, took us out to the Shiloh Inn for dinner. And I still decided to come. This is amazing to me. Um, <laughs> So at the end of June, I preached at Malin Presbyterian Church out in Malin, and I think we met somewhere near the church here, and we, we started driving out there, and I thought, where are they taking me? And uh, I'm wondering if I'm going to ever come back. Uh, so I preached out there, and then on August the 15th, 2004, uh, we pre I preached here for the very first time, and it's called candidating. And so you preach, and then everyone smiles at you, and then you exit the sanctuary, and you go sit in the library, as the congregation votes on you. It's just a wonderful experience. It's uh, <laughs> just uh, probably tops my list of things I've done in my life. Um, so by a count of 97 to zero, uh, folks here invited me to be their pastor. On October the 4th, 2004, I started, it was a Monday, and then my first service was October the 10th. Uh, October the 10th, 10-10, so I thought, well, I'll preach on John 10-10 which is I've come to give you life and give it to you abundantly. Uh, that first service, that first Sunday, we had two services, an informal service. It wasn't called a contemporary service. It was called an informal service. And at that service, we had 35 people. And then at the traditional service, we had 85 people. And the budget for First Pres at the time was about $170,000. It was just Julie and me at the time, and I was... Uh, in the Presbyterian Church, uh, at a certain time, you become installed as the pastor, kind of like an appliance. Um, so on December the 5th, I was installed, and on that day, we received 22 new members of the church. Um, we began right then and there on the, that day, uh, talking with a, a family and a young lady up in the Dalles, Oregon, about adopting the baby that was within, with, was within her. And... Um, it was in January. She said, I'm giving you my baby. And we said, all right. And so in May uh, 14th, uh, Faith Louise Dendy was born in the Dallas, Oregon. And um, 
and just three months earlier, uh, we had discovered that we were pregnant. And um, Julie said, I'm pregnant. And I said, by who? And so, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, so uh, May, Faith arrived in July. I got to climb Mount Shasta. In September, Steve Hamlin uh, joined us as a praise team leader. Therese Zager joined us on a part-time basis because we only had 20 kids in the program. No need to be a full-time role. Uh, and then in October of 05, Joshua arrived just five months after, after Faith. And it's been a, a wild ride uh, ever since. Uh, this program year, we've been averaging about 550 people in worship each Sunday. Uh, 180 kids, elementary kids on the rolls, men, women's programs, youth, uh, small groups. We're, we're becoming a seven-day-a-week church, which has been a dream of mine. Uh, our budget is close to $700,000. We have three services. We have outstanding praise team, band, music directors, choir, all these things. And best of all, we have outstanding people at FPC. Uh, and we voted a few weeks ago, what's our number one value in that we are uh, an accepting, non-judgmental, grace-filled church. And nothing could thrill me more than that being our, one of our top priorities. Uh, I've married... Uh, a number of you out there, uh, I mean, officiated at your weddings. Uh, <laughs> you got to be careful what you say. Uh, uh, and I certainly have uh, buried a lot of, of your loved ones uh, as well. Um, I've baptized, I've prayed with, and I've preached about 350 sermons so far. I've learned how to play the piano. I ran a marathon. And this is these challenges that I keep challenging myself with each year and so the challenge for next year I've been reluctant to commit to it so I'll make it public today uh, the challenge for next year will be to memorize the gospel of Mark and then to publicly recite it to all of you uh, someone said why Mark well, it's the shortest one uh, I mean that's it's the shortest gospel that's that's very obvious for me um, but I will, I will miss all of you this summer. Um, I will. And um, I'll miss being here at FPC. Uh, we have laughed often, and we will continue to move forward being fearless people. So our scripture today is from John uh, chapter 21. You have it here on the, the front of your notes. You have questions about John 21 on the inside there. A wonderful article about Peter following Jesus. And if you want to take notes, there's a blank spot on the back there. So let's look at God's word here. Starting with verse 1. After this, now, it's Jesus has risen from the dead. He's appeared to the, uh, to the disciples. And then Thomas wasn't there. And then he appeared to them again. And then Thomas was there. And... Uh, that's what we looked at last week. Thomas saying, hey, if I don't see his nail marks, then I'm not going to believe. And then Jesus shows up. Hey, check this out. And he says, oh, my Lord and my God. And then sometime later, it says here, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two others of his disciples were together. I wonder who these other two disciples were. Why didn't they get named? Um, who are you? Well, I was one of the other disciples uh, there. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Uh, if, the, if there's anything we, we, we see in this final chapter, it's going to be a deja vu experience for Peter. It will be deja vu all over again uh, for Peter. Peter is the, is the leader of the disciples. Uh, anytime you read in the Gospels and Jesus asks the disciples a question, who's the one who always comes up with an answer? It's Peter. You know, Jesus asked, and then Peter said. I mean, it just seems that's just the way it goes. Um, here we are by the sea. Jesus is going to encounter them at the sea. It's where Jesus encounters Peter for the very first time, by the sea. Uh, the boat, two boats are empty. The crowd is pressing in on Jesus. He's got his back up against the shoreline. He looks down, sees an empty boat, says, Peter, let's 
get in here, let's get in the boat together, let's push off a little ways. And then he begins to preach and teach to the people. After that, he looks at Peter and says, let's drop these nets in the deep waters. Where do you cast your nets? Are they in the shallow waters or do you cast your nets into the deep waters of who Jesus is? So he says, let's cast the nets in the deep waters. And Peter's like, hadn't caught anything. I've, I've been out here fishing, hadn't caught anything. Well, just try the deep waters. Catch, puts them in the deep waters, pulls in this unbelievable catch, and it's so heavy and so full that the nets are breaking. And it's at that point where uh, Jesus says to Peter, follow me follow me. And he does. And Peter follows along with 11 other disciples. And when the time comes when Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And and some disciples said, well, some people think you're Elijah. Some people think you're a prophet. Some people think this. And then it's Peter who says, you are the Christ. And Jesus says, right, you are. And then it's later on where Jesus says, you know, I'm going to Jerusalem. And when I get there, they're going to kill me. And Peter says, never. That will not happen on my watch. I'll make sure I protect you, watch over you, be by your side. And what does Jesus say? (laughs) Get behind me, Satan. You're standing in my way. Don't get in my way of what the Lord has willed for me to do. And then when Jesus does get arrested, who pulls out the sword and cuts off the guard's ear? Peter, of course. All these things. So he is... (coughs) <coughs> the leader, he is the, you know, the one. So when he says, I'm going fishing, well, of course the other, other disciples are going to go with them. They follow where Peter leads. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Do, do any of you, are, are any of you kind of professionals in what you do? I mean, you know what you do. You know how to do it. You do it day in and day out. You're, you're very proficient at it. You're efficient. It's what you get paid to do. And so it was with Peter. He's a commercial fisherman. This is what he does. He fishes. He catches fish. And so he's, he and his friends have been fishing all night, and they have caught nothing. And some guy on the shore, 100 yards away, he catch anything? No? Try casting your net on the other side of the boat there. Now, if you were in the boat, what would you be thinking? Who is this guy? What in the world? What does he know about this? He's a carpenter, for God's sake. You know, does this ever happen to you? You're the expert, and yet someone comes in and tries to tell you how to do your job. Has this ever happened? Happens to me at the door every Sunday. It's, a, it's amazing. Amazing to me. So, they cast it. So Peter's like, okay. And they cast the net on the other side. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards off. Now, does that seem backwards to you? If I'm going to jump in the water, I'm thinking I'm taking off my clothes. But Peter puts on his clothes and then jumps in the water and swims to shore. When they got out on, on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. Why 153? Boy, this has been discussed and commentated about for 2,000 years. What's the significance of 153? The answer, nobody knows. Uh, Some historians have said at that time, there were only 153 known species of fish, and so maybe that has something to do with it. Someone else who's big into numerology said, well, you know, if you take 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 plus 11 plus 12 plus 13 plus 14 plus 15 plus 16 plus 17, it equals 153. Wow. What's the significance of that? Well, you had 10 commandments, 
and he had seven churches, so 10 plus 7 is 17. Okay. Thanks so much. I have no idea why there were 153, but they counted them, and there were 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. See the deja vu? Big hall. The nets were being torn the first time, but the second time, they were not being torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Go back to that verse 9 there, in the beginning of the paragraph there. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place. Talking about the deja vu. When was the last time Peter saw a charcoal fire? Well, it was the night that Jesus was arrested. And they took him behind the gates there to be tried, and Peter di didn't go through the gates, so he, he warmed himself by what? A charcoal fire. As he's warming himself, the people around there look at him and say, Aren't you? Didn't you, didn't you hang out with Jesus? Oh, no, not me. Are you sure? No, 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 no. You have, you have me mistaken for somebody else. Are you absolutely sure? I'm sure. I don't even know the guy. And then the rooster crows. And Jesus had said, when the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. And Jesus, I mean, Peter goes out and he weeps bitterly. So the charcoal fire, a deja vu. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? That's always a difficult question to ask a fisherman. Do you love fishing more than me? Better be sure you know the answer before you ask that question. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I've told the story before. I was in, when I was consulting, I was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, working with the church out there. And when I arrived at my hotel that night, uh, there was a bouquet of flowers. And it was from Julie. And we'd been dating for about three months and up to that point, I had never told Julie that I loved her. Just said, okay, bye, or good to see you, thanks so much, take care, you know. But I never said, I love you. This is not something you say over the phone for the first time. But I was so moved by the generosity of the flowers one night, I called her up and I said, Julie, I've been wanting to tell you something. I hate the fact that I'm telling you over the phone, but I love you. Then there was that pause. <laughs> wait, wait. It seemed like an eternity. It's probably only half a second. But there's only one acceptable response. You know, I love you too. Uh, if she had said, oh, well, thanks. <laughs> you know, appreciate it. Well, how nice of you to say that to me. You know, I mean... There's only one acceptable response. I love you too. So Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Three times he asked him, three, do you love me? Now, a common interpretation of this is for each time that uh, Peter denied Christ, Christ was giving him an opportunity to affirm his love for Jesus. You denied me three times, I'm going to give you three opportunities to say you love me. And so this is a, an act of restoration. Let's restore Peter back to being the leader. Let's restore him back to being who Peter is and who God called or who Jesus called Peter to be. And that's a great interpretation. I think that's great. You know, do you love me? Yes, I do. Well, here, then let's be restored. Let's be renewed. Let's be forgiven. Let's mercy reign here. And let's, let's, get, let's start over again. And I think that's a wonderful interpretation. I think there's a... a just personally, I think there's something else going on. Uh, in counseling, what I've learned about myself, what I've learned about other people, is that there's always a question at hand. Anytime you're in any, any kind of 
counseling situation? Um, whose needs are being met? You know, I, I want to ask a question. Was well, that my need that I, I need to ask the question? Or am I asking a question to help that person because that person needs to acknowledge or needs to answer that question? Whose needs are being met here? So with Jesus and Peter, when Jesus asked the question, do you love me? Who, whose needs are at stake here? Is it Peter? Or maybe it's Jesus. I just wonder if it just might be Jesus' needs that need to be met here. He knows that Peter loves him. He's Jesus. He's the Son of God. But that human side of him, I just wonder if he was thinking, I've been with you for three years. We've been through a lot together. It wasn't too long ago you were denying me. And yet I died for you and I was raised for you. And I'm getting ready to leave in a few days here. And I got to know. I have to know. Do you love me? Do you? Yeah, of course I do. Thank you. I feed my sheep. Do you love me? And this goes on three times. And part of me just thinks Jesus had to know before he left. Do you love me? Of course, Peter says he does. Now, the beautiful thing is, uh, it, doesn't just stop, it doesn't just stop with, I love you. Jesus goes on to say, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. There's action uh, that, that goes with this. Go out and catch fish. Go out and catch men. Go out there and get them. Bring them in. Our church has grown a lot over the last seven years. You know, first get here, there's 100 people. Now we're averaging 550 people. How does this happen? How, how, how and why does this happen? As with any church that grows, the original body can become threatened by the growth. Like, whoa, who are these new people? This, the church is changing. It's not the way it used to be. And I can remember someone from that original body coming to me and saying, all these new people, they're making me nervous. And it's your fault that they're coming. <laughs> and I said, not much to the satisfaction of this person, I haven't invited anybody to church. It's all the people out here. They're, they're inviting people. I don't, I don't invite people to church, really. It, it seems almost, I don't know, it just seems self-centered to me. Hey, come listen to me talk on Sunday mornings. You'll have a lot of fun. Ah, it just, it's hard for me to do that. I will say, come check out our church. We've got great people and that. But, but you're the ones. It's your fault that there's so many people here. Because you go out there, you love Jesus, and you go out there and you start telling other people, you got to come check this out. I mean, there's, there's, I've read about this. I've seen articles on it. I've seen books written on it. I never, ever thought I would see it personally. But this is how I've seen it work. I, I've, as I look out there right now, I can see it right now. A family shows up. A husband or a wife shows up. I, hey, nice to meet you. Glad you're here. Two or three weeks later, well, the kids show up. And then a few weeks later, the parents and the grandparents or the grandkids or whatever. And then all of a sudden, we got one family. They, they take up two pews in our church every Sunday. It's amazing to me. People show up, they invite their friends. So you are doing a great job of inviting your friends, inviting your coworkers. It's every person I meet is always connected to someone else in here. Rarely does someone just show up, well, I was just walking by, I thought I'd come on in. It's by y'all's invitation, uh, y'all feeding and tending the sheep out there. It has just been incredible. And I cannot thank you enough for that. So Jesus says in verse 18, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Peter goes on to lead the church, writes letters, 
preaches, speaks, stands up for Jesus, and he's martyred, he's killed, he's crucified. And upon being crucified, if you've ever wondered what would make someone say, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the way Jesus was crucified, so please crucify me upside down. Well, now maybe you know, because that was Peter. Don't, don't crucify me like Jesus. Turn me upside down. Jesus says to him after that, follow me. It's the first words Jesus says to Peter. It's the last words Jesus says to Peter. Follow me. Then the very end there, verse 24. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And I love the way the book ends. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Do you love me? It's a great question. I have a feeling that you love me. I'm just going to go with that. Don't, don't shake your head like this. Or just, just go with me on this one. I, I, I know, I know that the people at First Presbyterian Church love me. Uh, you've shown it in so many different ways. So the question on the last Sunday before my sabbatical that you may be wondering, David, do you love us? You may be wondering, do you, David, do you love me? Because I know there's some people out there, well, Dendy, he's kind of a wild card, you know. He, he kind of holds the cards close to the vest, not very authentic, doesn't show himself very much, and he's go away for three months, and who knows if he's coming back in September. He says he is, but you never know with him. Do I love you? I do. I do. I do, and I will, for as long as the Lord will keep me here. I do. I will miss you this summer. Wherever I go, every church I attend, I will miss you. And I'll be thinking, oh, I wish I could be at first prize. Because the Wilbrights always sit over here, and the Quatmans always sit over there, and the Monforts always right there. Never here, never there, right there. You know? And the Rooneys are always way back in the back row. I will miss you. So while I'm gone, tend to the sheep, feed the sheep, just as you have been. And we will continue to go forward following Jesus wherever he leads us in a great way. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you ask us, do you love me? And we say we do. You tell us to go feed, to go tend the sheep. And so may we do just that. To go tend and feed the sheep of Klamath Falls, of Klamath County, and in the borders even beyond that. And watch over us as we go our separate ways. And help us to know that you never leave us nor forsake us. That you walk with us step by step, day by day. Wherever we go, you are always with us. In Jesus' name.